Welcome to episode 182 of Tim Talk, the podcast about the DC animated universe, co-created by Bruce Tim. I'm Chris Lord. I'm Cameron Dexter. And we're back this week with some more Justice League. Uh, yes. We're finally watching the episodes you thought we were going to be reviewing last week. Yes. The Terror Beyond. <laughs> the Terror of Cthulhu. The Terror of Cthulhu? It's Cthulhu. Cthulhu. It's, it's just Cthulhu. It's, it's Dwayne just... McDuffie's take on... Uh, lovecraft exactly it's blatantly cthulhu now i was super excited for these because these are actually some of my favorite episodes now you started to watch them last week you finished them this week what did you think of them the opening is great okay and then for me it kind of once once they revealed cthulhu Mm -hmm. which was a very weird reveal as the the cliffhanger okay uh kind of lost me at that point really yeah see i i love these episodes these have been some of my favorite look i love atlantean stories in both dc and out of dc yeah i love theorizing about why atlantis sank uh i love cthulhu stories separate from atlantean stories i think that there's too many things brewing in this pot just too much kind of yeah well too many cooks too many cooks too many fates <laughs> too many different kinds because we had grundy magic which is based off of um kind of new orleans yeah a uh, little bit of kind of voodoo, voodoo yeah that's the word a little bit yeah. yeah grundy's kind of voodoo magic dr fate is very celestial magic mm-hmm. uh hot girl is very thanagarian outer space different kind of cosmic magic like alien slash science yeah. slash then magic. atlantean magic is in there there's there's this because like obviously last week's episode i i argued there was that's it was fair. almost not enough magic <laughs> well last week we were saying there wasn't enough magic but also that there was just too many things happening there like you, you, okay that's fair like the thing we were both complaining about last week i just seem to not care about this week and that there's just too many things going on because like at the end of the day i really like these because of the hot girl grundy story and i know part of the reason i like them so much is because when they revisit that story in just League unlimited that episode is one of my all-time favorites yes and and we won't say exactly what happens but when we get to it we'll we'll talk about it obviously in depth and it's it's, it's a very poignant episode and so um like i i guess i'm maybe bringing in some of that I don't want to call it baggage, because what's the opposite of baggage? Baggage is negative. Bringing some of that love, joy, I don't know. Yeah, joy. <laughs> joy. I guess that's an emotion some people feel nowadays. I, I fail to understand the concept. <laughs> but I'm bringing some of that with me into this. Yeah. Which is part of the reason I liked it so much. But I found myself having to stop and remind myself to take notes, because I was just watching them, mm-hmm. just to watch them and enjoy them. And I took a lot of notes, and it made me not enjoy them. <laughs> because i got to question everything well maybe you just gotta find a nice happy medium yes somewhere in the middle just like kind of casual notes and i will based off of your point that you just made and the arguments that i get against me all the time Mm -hmm. where people say because i i'm still at this point standing that jlu is better than justice league i agree with that okay a lot of people don't who doesn't agree with that? a lot of my friends mostly my friend group do they understand well so here's my point and to what you just said the best episodes of Justice League are when they team up with other members. Yeah. Which is just what JLU is. That's yeah. the whole premise of JLU. No, so I mean, when you're coming at me, not you, but <laughs> people online slash my friend group, when they're coming at me and they're like, oh, you know, JLU is just a hodgepodge of like superhero. Uh, what it? It, it, They just want to like show off who's in their gallery. I'm like, yeah, because yeah. that's cool. I, mean, I want to see that. I, 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 I'm sure some of your friends listen to this, and I'm sorry. I, I probably don't know most of you, but you're just wrong. JLU yeah. is better. Like it is, it it tackles both anthology storytelling with kind of random heroes, which are these kind of fun one-off episodes, and it has some of the best serialized, some of the only serialized storytelling in all of the DCAU. Like the stuff they were doing so well in JLU eventually became the stuff that makes Young Justice so good. Yeah. Like, it's a precursor to that. I, I think it's the ultimate evolution of this universe. Absolutely, yeah. Of, that's what I've been trying to tell and, them for a while. Yeah, and so characterization. Like, but there's Starcrossed. Like, I've never seen Starcrossed, and I so, and a lot of people hate me for that. Starcrossed is amazing. Yes, and I've heard that from every single person <laughs> online ever. And me, on this podcast, <laughs> a lot during this season. Yes. 
I'm sure I'll love it when I see it in yeah. a couple weeks. Look, we're 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 getting into a home stretch here of some of the best of Justice League. So we're going to be doing Hereafter and coming up pretty soon here. I don't know if it's maybe next week or the week following. That's a great two-parter. Mm-hmm. Um, we're getting Wild Card, which is when the Joker... The, have you seen that one where the Joker takes over the casino in Vegas? Ooh, no. Okay, that's a really fun one, too. We're getting Comfort and Joy, the, the holiday episode. Great. Like, we're getting some really good stuff coming up here. But to my recollection, the episodes that stand out the most are often JLU. Yeah. Because it's... Yeah. it's they wrap up all of the stuff they're setting up here. I mean, it's the same, yeah. it's the same points we made during Superman of like, we know some of this is a drag and I'm not saying any of these are drags. Yeah. But like, well, well, last, last week, week, last week, last week was a but drag. Like, yeah. Like the thing we kept thinking about and mentioning during Superman was like, they're setting everything up. We meet Dr. F- we met Dr. Fate four years ago. Yeah. We met, you know, Kyle Rayner four years ago and I started to learn about the Green Lanterns back then. Aquaman was set up back then. Yeah. You know, this is technically a different Aquaman. I mean, I, I think it's supposed to be like more or less the same Aquaman. Yeah. But I don't think we even included a fish story on our short list. No, we didn't. I have it somewhere and I'm pretty sure it's like, nah, we don't need this. Uh, it's like, yeah, they're they're so good at setting up the nuggets that they're going to yeah. kind of complete later. Exactly. And 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 I think even the better way of looking at it, it's not that they're setting up the nuggets they're going to complete later, but that the later shows are really good about picking up threads that never were mm-hmm. fully completed to a satisfying conclusion and finding a way to give them a satisfying conclusion. Yeah. Um, I, I'd say with the exception maybe being Batman, who unfortunately they just weren't able to tell Batman stories at that point because of the, the bat embargo that was happening at the time. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I just thought it's because once Kevin Conroy sang they're just like we did it it's we, peaked we, yeah, i mean they did done. peak at that point they yeah. definitely did but no it was because of the nolan trilogy well mm. it wasn't a trilogy yet at that point but batman begins came out and then right after that they basically said okay we're going to very strictly limit what batman stories can be told in other mediums basically on, in cartoons to yeah. hold on to things for like what would become the nolan trilogy which is why for example in the batman which is the cartoon that came out like around the same time just like sort of cross promote we don't get Ra's al Ghul, we don't get Scarecrow, we don't get Two-Face. Um, they just held on to a lot of those. Like, some characters they couldn't avoid. Like, you had to have the Joker in there no matter what. Yeah, and that's a very unique take on the Joker. Every, every is, character yeah. in, that, in that series is very different than... It is. I, I actually mostly like them. I, I hated it when it came out. Okay. Because Titans was... Uh, Teen Titans was out yeah. while that was going on. And that was clearly, at least for me, the superior yeah show i and i haven't revisited titan so i can't really get into debate with you on that but i I will say this for anyone who's been skeptical about revisiting the batman and i I honestly don't know if it's up on hbo max yet or not um but i would say get like watch at least the first two seasons i think the first two are really good stories about a young bruce wayne just taking on the mantle of the batman in season three they bring in jim gordon and batgirl and then season four they bring in robin and season five they start doing some justice league stuff and it just it got a little bit more kidified at that point, and they started drawing some more blatant inspiration for the 1960s, more campy stories, and it just mm-hmm. didn't land quite as well. Um, but those first two, I, I still hold up as being really, really good and um, different, but really great character designs as well. I don't see the Batman. Oh, okay. On... Well, well, it doesn't matter. We're not here to talk about the Batman, are we? Or even no. Teen Titans, Cameron. I'm so sorry. We are I mean, ultimately. We will always talk about Teen Titans. <laughs> this will always be a secret backdoor pilot for Titan Titans Talk. Titans Talk. Podcast entropy. We inevitably start talking about Teen Titans. Uh, but no, we're here to talk about the terror beyond. Yes. Do you want to give us a quick rundown of what happened in these episodes? Yeah, exactly. So let me go through kind of a, a quick thing. So let's let's before I get into like the full on synopsis, let's at least talk about the rather surprising cold open. Because it sees the army chasing down Grundy for no real reason, I think, other than he's just a villain and they're trying to capture him. Um, But they basically get him pinned on a pier and it looks like he's finally going to get taken out by some massive weird energy tank beam thing that they have in this universe. And right before that happens, uh, a giant sea serpent busts out of the water and Aquaman is riding its back. It's like, nah, brah, he's coming with me. And he like jumps in, takes out the army and steals Grundy. And you're like, wait, what the hell is this? Like, yeah. Because you hadn't seen these before. No. And so, obviously, it's been two weeks now, but you watched that opening. What was your thought at the end of that cold open? Because that's a pretty bold way to start off an episode. Yeah, I I don't know what I was thinking. I was just so, like, caught up in it. Yeah. It's like, where is this going? Because mm-hmm. that's such a unique team-up of 
Aquaman and Grundy. Yeah, As right? the, Again, like I mentioned before, they're from such different worlds. Well, um, they both came from water. It's true. <laughs> As it comes a to source learn. of water, yes. yes. A, a puddle, a very they, muddy puddle. They both have significant water-based origins. Yeah. <laughs> Like like you, I was born from water. It's like I don't remember that. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, Grundy confused. Yeah, and it you know this is a, a good Grundy episode. It is. I mean, I think it's it's well. He only has three. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of the only real Grundy focused one. I think he always got good moments in the previous episodes that he was in. Um, yeah. But this is the first one that really gives him proper storytelling and does a really nice job with it too. But yeah, so I mean, we get that very surprising cold open, and I, I haven't seen these in. 17 years whenever they originally aired so i vaguely recall things but i don't remember all the details so when that happened i was like oh shit that's how this starts i completely forgot about this um but yeah so basically aquaman saves grundy from the military and then we learned that aquaman and dr fate need grundy to complete a spell that will seal a breach that is allowing ancient monsters aka the old ones the old ones aka yeah. Cthulhu, Cthulhu. yeah <laughs> um to break into our dimension and so that's kind of all happening as like I'd say the more or less the A story here. And then you know, Superman, Wonder Woman, Hawk Girl don't know that this is going on yet. All they know is that sea monsters are attacking people. Mm-hmm. They immediately suspect that's Aquaman. So they basically go on a journey to try and track down where Aquaman is that eventually leads them to Dr. Fate's tower. And then they see what appears to be Grundy being tortured during this incantation, this spell. But it's actually them trying to seal this breach. And when the Justice League interrupts it, um, some pretty sweet fights ensue. And then all thing falls apart. And then, of course, the breach fails and pops through a little spindly legged Cthulhu. Yes. So, I mean, it's 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 one of those situations where an email could have saved <laughs> so much time. Just a letter. Like, they all know each other. Aquaman knows the Justice League. Yeah. Justice League knows fate. Or at least Superman knows Superman fate. Superman knows him. Yeah. Fate can teleport anywhere at any time, whenever, wherever. Just be like, hey, guys, just so you know, there's a cosmic breach that's about to take over the planet. I know that's kind of your thing that yeah. you've been handling for the past two years. Uh, but I'm going to take this one. Uh, we're going to take Grundy. It's going to hurt him a little bit, but, you know, he's immortal. Yeah. Superman, it's about as damaging as one of your punches. <laughs> uh, so just like, you know, I'll let you know when everything's cool. Yeah. And we can come and party in the alternate dimension later. Look, I I do agree with you that this all hangs on them just not having a very quick conversation. It would take a minute, maybe max. Yeah. And even at the, even the of beginning this. of part two, they're like, hey, can you explain this? Like, we don't have time. Make but you time. do Make yeah time. you yeah. do you yeah. just banish him back to the portal look i i and you will... can literally teleport instantaneously <laughs> anywhere i will agree with you that the justification they use for getting everyone to fight to kind of put some action padding this episode doesn't hold up to even like the most cursory scrutiny but i will say that i'm i guess i'm willing to forgive that because i like what this episode is doing overall i like it's basically doing setup, mystery, and action. And I think it's doing all three of those pretty, pretty well. Mm-hmm. Like it's setting up what's going to happen in episode two in terms of laying out why this odd collection of people is together. Why are Grundy, Fate, and Aquaman together? Um, and why are they using a Thanagarian spell? Exactly. Why are they using a Thanagarian spell? It starts setting up a little bit more backstory on Hot Girl, which mm-hmm. we haven't really had up till now, and is going to be pretty. We learn pretty. her name. We do learn her name exactly. Good old Shayer Hall. And, you know, this is all going to be necessary setup for Starcrossed. It's impossible for me not to mention Starcrossed. <laughs> kind of dancing around it constantly. But, you know, it's doing all that setup pretty well. I think, yeah, the, the mystery could be solved by a quick conversation, but I find it at least mostly intriguing. Yeah. Like, I, I think for me, at least, I was I, I just finished rereading uh, Prisoner of Azkaban. Like, oh, okay. Hours before watching these episodes. And so yeah. That ending is also very frustrating where serious you know when they finally meet serious he's like being so vague about yeah i didn't actually kill him it was actually our friend peter yeah um and you're like just fucking say that just say it <laughs> don't dance around like well technically i killed them it's like no you you didn't you may think you did yeah <clears throat> you may blame yourself but you didn't just tell him you didn't tell him it's this other guy who's been acting like a rat for the past 12 years mm-hmm. 
I, it's, I guess, yeah, maybe there's a little bit of Dwayne McDuffie pulling from the J.K. Rowling school mm. of writing, which is save all your exposition to the very end. Yeah. Including revealing that you're a horrible monster. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> Dwayne McDuffie wasn't a monster, was he? No, but J.K. Rowling yeah, is. Yeah, I know she is. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, I don't, no I mean, McDuffie's he's, amazing. Yeah. He's like a fucking legend uh, and gone too soon, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like, there is an element of that. Like, they, they could have just solved this very quickly by chatting. But I will say that there's a they they allude enough to what's going on like even when they're doing this spell they haven't laid out why they're doing it they just keep saying like we're gonna steal this breach and they you know keep saying words like breach or something like that in um in the context of casting the spell plus we get fate just like constantly like what does it say like by the hand of fate or something like that or that a fate demands yeah fate demands, fate demands. yeah hand of fate is digimon that's right <laughs> Um, also worth acknowledging right up here that this is a voice casting change also for fate who I can't remember who he was. Uh, let's see, George De Hoyo in Superman. But in this case, it's Oded Fair, who I fucking love. You may not know who that is, but he was, I guess, is he the Magi? I forget his name in the mummy. Oh, okay. Yeah. He also appears in the most recent season of Star Trek Discovery. He's been in constant he's just stuff left and right. But I mean, one of the the great voices. That's fun. Yeah. Also, <laughs> kind of a, a slight tangent here. Have you seen that that meme? Um, people saying like my sexuality is the cast of the Mummy, and it's mm-hmm. just like Brendan Fraser, Rachel Weisz, Odette Fair, and then I forget who plays. Uh, is it Never? An Oxen Moon. That's right. Yeah, but it's like those four people, and you're like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's the most beautiful cast ever. <laughs> But I love him, and I think he's great as Dr. Fate. Like, he gives it a really amazing gravitas. Because mm-hmm. a lot of those lines could be really silly. Yeah, and, and Fate as a character. Like, I love Dr. Fate. Oh, I same. love Nobu. Yeah. I haven't been, but I heard the food's good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I've also never been. <laughs> I can't afford it. <laughs> Nor can I. Um, you know, and a lot of that love stems from Young Justice, where he gets yeah. amazing arcs. Yes, he does, um, yeah. But yeah, you know, he he is kind of this very vague character and, mm-hmm. and he can get away with these vague notions. Um, but like if someone say anything, <laughs> like I'm so tired, and you know, like it is the frustrating part of like I understand why, because you have uh Aquaman who is a king and he has yeah. to explain himself to no one mm-hmm. except Mira. Yeah. Um, and then you have Fate who has to explain himself to no one yeah. ever. It's like, this is what the universe said. And like, well, fuck you. Like, no, he didn't. <laughs> I, I guess I can. I can Grundy's f- just Grundy. He's just Grundy. He doesn't understand. I'm a little bit more forgiving here, I think, because it's still absurd. They don't just talk, but I can kind of buy it from these characters. The, the only one who I don't buy from a Superman, who I feel like should have been making a bigger effort to step in, be like, hey, let's stop fighting and talk. Because everyone else is a very like action focused person ahead of time. And I think mm-hmm. even their pairing of the heroes is really clever when they do splinter off into fights. So it's yeah. Superman up against Grundy who you can't really reason with Grundy. So he has kind of no choice but to fight. And then you have one Roman against Aquaman. So the two, you know, two Royals, two Royals. and there, there comes an arrogance with that, like a sense of superiority. And I think one Roman suffers from it a lot less than Aquaman. But oh, and in she still this has it. Fight though, this specific fight. This is, and I even put this in my notes. This is the first time, at least in American animation, that I like saw a fighting style in, like, in the animation. Oh, like, interesting. The way Wonder Woman fights Aquaman mm-hmm. is very different from how that you know it's not just straight head in. I'm gonna punch you until one of us falls. Yeah, like you see her thinking about the moves she's doing, and she's very like. It does feel like a fight between royals where yeah. like these are people that were both trained by the best most ancient deities yeah and you see her like being almost fighting defensively and in fighting mm-hmm. like a, almost like a batman would fight no i mean against that's... him because he's just going headstrong and she's yeah. on the more like hey well, let's you don't have to do this but if you want to get into this then i'll fucking get into this yeah if you want to rumble we'll rumble yeah and, and that's a good point. I mean, they're both warrior races at the end of the day. I don't remember there being a lot of interaction between um, the Amazons and the Atlanteans in the DC AU specifically. Obviously, mm-hmm. in other iterations, there's more stuff like yeah, Flashpoint. Yeah. It's a whole whole arc. But, you know, mm-hmm. there is a lot of similarity between those two. I mean, they're ancient secluded races that are born natural warriors. Yeah. And I, I think that's part of the reason I like this episode is that the individual fights were super interesting. I think that was my favorite, too. Like, I believe they would kill each other 
Oh yeah, I, I think Wonder Woman, and also like both of them be proud about it. Yeah, like this is great because you were like a worthy opponent. Exactly, and th there is this sort of like slight simmering of respect between the two of them a little bit. They, they, I think there is an appreciation of each other's prowess, but obviously Aquaman is the much more arrogant, headstrong of the two. Yeah, maybe less likely to show it. But you know, I fully believe that you know if no one stopped to intervene, they would kill each other. And given how the fight ends. It's not too far off. I mean, yeah. it, it goes for a while, and then Aquaman just basically grabs Wonder Woman and drags her underwater until he just drowns her until she's unconscious. Yeah. I don't know if that's a thing you can really do to someone. In, like in drowning, cartoons drowning. and drowning. In kids' show, I feel like yeah. that's the go to yes. of like non violent, incapacitating. Exactly. Just, just smother them with water until they're not yet dead. Yeah. But almost kind of dead. Yeah. Straddling that line. Yes. But I mean, it's, it's pretty intense it's a pretty intense moment yeah. you know and then when they go back to the portal you know aquaman's just carrying diana and she's unconscious and then you know the other fight is between hawk girl and dr fate and that's an interesting one because this is the first time we've seen that um hawk girl's mace has an effect against magic mm -hmm. we didn't know that up to this nth point metal. yeah we don't even know that it's nth metal yet that's true yeah um we just know now that it has an effect on magic i mean she can break through dr fate's tower you know she can deflect his energy blast that sort of thing which is a huge reveal we didn't know that about her at all and we'll come to learn that it's because thanagarian technology was gifted to them by cthulhu slash cthulhu you know way way back in the day but it's rare that i buy into a hero on hero fight mm -hmm. and i thought this more or less worked and i thought the pairings were really interesting and for filler action they were at least good fight sequences yeah to watch there there was a great line in the beginning when we first see the trio and to your point i think it's why superman is kind of this is at least how i perceived this moment because mm -hmm. there's a great line that hot girl says to superman when they're in the quinjet <laughs> oh yeah which is not the quinjet the javelin the javelin thank you of a do you ever get chafed straddling the line so much yep which is beautiful <laughs> writing i love that line so much it's it's a great line it's a it's a great delivery of the yeah. line too and i mean hawk girl gets a lot of one-liners over the course of the series here she gets a whole bunch of them oh yeah this, this episode just was chock full of good one-liners so good i mean even early on when they're trying to fight off the sea monster that's attacking a cruise ship and one woman says you know hera give me strength Hawk Girl's response is, must you say that all the time? Yes. <laughs> Which is funny because she really doesn't say it all the time. She said it three times. Three, yes, exactly. <laughs> and and as, as I was, because I'm sure you read the same facts. Yeah. Hawk Girl's never around when she said it. No, yeah. This is the first time she's heard it. <laughs> I imagine that Wonder Woman's just saying it maybe gratuitously all the time. Like it's, an, like it's a, a late night shift at the watchtower and Wonder Woman's falling asleep. She's like, oh, Hera, give me strength. I'm falling asleep. Well, hon, who is, who is wisdom? <laughs> At least in Shazam. I don't know. Uh, this is your territory, Solomon. Cameron. I think, yeah, Solomon. Yeah, right? Uh, no, Solomon is... The Wisdom of Solomon, right? Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Uh, I like to think that she does it, like, everywhere all the time. Just, so she's yeah. doing, like, the Sunday crossword. <laughs> yeah. It's like, Solomon, give me wisdom. And it's like, can you just... It's fucking 930, Wonder yeah. Woman. <laughs> just let it go. Please let it go. Yeah. <laughs> Hawk girl just Hephaestus, give me patience. Like, fuck <laughs> off. Hawk girl just standing there, like weighing her mace, like ah, I could do it. I could do it. I could do it. Batman would understand. Yeah. He'd have my back. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's uh, oh. So, so the, the point I was making is, I mm -hmm. feel like Superman is more. You know, I I feel like that line may have gotten to him a little bit. Yeah, you know, he doesn't show it. But he's just like, well, I don't want to. I'm not straddling the fence. I'm gonna. You're gonna punch. I'll. I'll punch too. Yeah. I'll, I'll show you that I'm not straddling the fence. The only way you can bruise him is to bruise his ego. Yeah. Or to hit him with a like a magical tentacle. Or just be Batman. Or just be Batman. Steal all from him. <laughs> also, now that I think about it, maybe part of the reason I like this episode so much is there's a lot of bare chest in this, isn't there? There is. Aquaman just refuses to wear a shirt all the time. Good on yeah, him. Yeah. Get wet yeah that would be silly you know it's like what the one of the worst feelings in the world is when you have a wet t-shirt that won't unstick from you that is absolutely true yeah i mean he's not full on namor running around in just a speedo unfortunately yeah but it, there, there's still enough to kind of make it work to get him superman takes a shirt off for a nice extended sequence when they're in the javelin 
And I guess we'll kind of count Grundy. You know, he's got some pretty substantial pecs. It's true. Yeah. He's got a vest on, though. He's got a vest. I got to like a vest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's from watching Magic Mike so many times. I have a love for bare chests and vests. It wasn't Aladdin. <laughs> oh, fair point. And that's where it all started. That's, that's a fair point. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Mm. Mm. Uh, but yeah, so they, they all fight and then they come back and then it's the reveal of cthulhu yeah that's what we're trying to prevent as cthulhu pops through yeah and okay i think i think maybe there's one more reason why i'm kind of giving this a bit of a pass is there are elements of this that remind me of just like the new frontier which i'm always talking about it being my favorite comic Mm -hmm. but without going into full detail of what happens in that story there's some like slightly cthulhu-esque monsters going on in that as well yeah um i just rewatched the movie the other day it's really good it's very good yeah i think it's one of the it's one of the best i mean i mean it's my favorite comic of all time and i think that adaptation is pretty solid Mm -hmm. so it's mph of the flash right yes yeah it's a good flash it's very good barry allen um yeah like i think there's some pieces in here that kind of remind me of that comic which is also why i'm like giving it a slight pass yeah a little bit still a lot going on it, look, it is. It's there's a there's a lot that happens in this episode, but I don't know. I, I totally understand your point, but for me, it never felt gratuitous um, or feel like filler, which a lot of these episodes do, especially if they're just packing in like an extended action sequence to pad out. I mean, this first this part. was an eight minute action sequence. <laughs> but I, for me, it didn't drag on though. At no point I was like, "Can you just yeah, wrap I mean, yeah, this?" Yeah, because it was three separate. It, it it wasn't as bad as like Superman finding Wonder Woman a couple weeks ago. Exactly. Which yeah lasted half the episode. Yeah, and and that was another those moments too. I'm like, it just it felt contrived to put them together. And yeah, I guess this is probably no less contrived. But I was a little just more on board, I think, because the action's good, and I can kind of buy it a little bit Which more. Which I also, like, coming from the animation industry and the animation side of this, I find it so fascinating that you pad time with action, because action's the most expensive thing to animate. Yeah. And so they're not, like, saving money doing this. I like, think anime no. is, is infamous for doing the, like, the freeze frames. Yeah. And just constantly cutting and holding on faces. As that is how they pad time. It it definitely seems silly because you're right. It's it's costs time and money to do it, and I guess because it's always made a kids cartoon, they're like, you can't bore the kids with too much exposition. Yeah, so tell that to <laughs> Dragon Ball Z. That's why I don't watch Dragon Ball Z, <laughs> amongst many reasons why I don't watch Dragon Ball yeah. Z. <laughs> There's a lot of shirtless guys in it. A lot of training montages. Shirtless training montages. Of course. Who's gonna, who's gonna except when they do when they add in weighted clothing. Because that is the anime thing to do. It's like yeah. you want to get stronger, wear this fifty pound vest all the time. So I didn't say fifty, I mean five hundred pound vest all the time. Well that that might do it. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, well maybe I'll watch it up to the point where they start putting on clothes. Yeah. <laughs> Should I talk to my therapist about why no. I'm so sexually attracted to male cartoon characters? No. Well, there's a small <laughs> window. I I do have to say there's a small window because they start off as children. Okay. You don't want to watch it then. No. But Best then there's avoid. a two-year time skip at the end of Dragon Ball before he fights Piccolo, King Piccolo, for the first time. Okay. So you have, like, that arc leading into the Raditz arc. Okay. Um, the, those are those are your prime shirtless Goku moments. Oh, okay. Cameron, I also appreciate that you have uh, tricked me into actually listening <laughs> to you talk about Dragon Ball Z because you're enticing me with shirtless I've learned. Men. I've <laughs> evolved as a character. <laughs> my thirst outweighs my impatience. The, the second half of the Frieza arc. No, we're good. Yeah, okay. we're good. That's the best one, though. This movie becomes a Super Saiyan. Okay. More Super shirtless? Pecs. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right. Yeah, Just... at that point, they all lose their shirts because they flex so much. Oh, ooh, all right, yeah. Mm. All right, now I'm on board. <laughs> yes. I'm on board. But yeah, I mean, that that basically sets up all the stuff that's going to happen in episode one, and so we'll go ahead and move on to like episode two here, um, where they are able to temporarily banish... Let's we'll just call it what it is. Cthulhu. It's Cthulhu, yeah. Back to his dimension. Um, oh, one thing I totally forgot about actually in episode one, we get Solomon Gurney's backstory. Oh, yeah. Totally uh, was... Cy- Cyprus Gold. Cyrus Gold. Cyrus Gold. Yeah, so he was just kind of a ruthless gangster who was double-crossed by some of his fellow gangsters and riddled with bullets via a Tommy gun. And it, and it really, I thought that sequence was actually done pretty well mm-hmm. in terms of like the sepia tone, in terms of actually having the, the blatant violence happen off screen, but... That's a great thing about animation and kid stuff. If it's a shadow we're seeing instead of an actual body getting like 
spasming as it's getting count. Hit, hit by countless bullets. It's all counts, but then they they take his body and they already I guess the the gangsters put some sort of curse on him to begin with, and they dumped him in a swamp which had its own right because inherent it was, magical it was, properties. Again, it was two separate kinds of magic they performed there. Yeah. I don't remember what the the gangster magic was. Yeah, so it's just money. <laughs> um, but yeah, because that curse interfered with the voodoo curse on the land on the swamp. Yeah. yeah. And caused him. Was to... it a Native American curse? I don't think so. No. Okay. I, they, yeah. I, I think the implication is it's it's a swamp. So. No, I mean the one they did on Grundy. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. They, they didn't specify. It's very. So that is now five types of magic in these episodes. Vague curses happening on Salman Grundy, but it creates a unique combination that basically resurrects him as a uh, a soulless hulking Immortal. monster. Yeah. Um, and so after he finally learned, cause he's all he wants is gold. Like even when Aquaman tries to lure him into helping them, his promise is a bunch of gold. Once Grinny learns his backstory, he realized the one thing that he's missing is his soul. And so now that's the thing that he wants back. And it's a little bit unclear if fate intends to actually help him get his soul, get his soul back. Or... I would say no. It's weird, though, because I i mean, Fate is an interesting character because I believe he would do whatever it takes for the greater good. hes I mean, he's basically just like Doctor Strange. They are yeah. they are very much similar in terms of not only power set, um, but also in terms of just their general approach. So I could believe that he would dupe Grundy, but he also is he's pretty sincere. He doesn't come off as the kind of person who would lie necessarily. So I feel like he intended to do something to try and help. Well, this, this not strange. Sorry, this fate, it, I feel like is closer to because I mean I, you we see fate for a minute in the parallax, or not the parallax, the return of Green Lantern arc. Okay, I guess it's the parallax arc, parallax beginning of parallax arc, mm-hmm. um, and Scepter, where he is kind of this cosmic figure. Because I think I would put him a rank above Strange. Because where Strange is kind of the mortal protector, Dr. Fate feels kind of just like he's he's almost above all human desire. So he so the character even in this episode calls on the Lords of Order to help him in this spell, like casting the spell. And I looked it up very briefly, but the Lords of Order are like a collection of cosmic beings, magical beings in the DC universe. And so I think Nobu, the, the spirit of Nobu, but like whatever possesses the helmet of Nobu. Yeah is one of those Lords of Order. And right. so uh, Dr. Fate, who I think is something Kent here? Um, yes. He is an agent of the Lords of Order. Yes. And, and I would agree with you. Yeah, like Dr. Strange wields cosmic power and wields magical abilities uh, beyond other people. Like he's just better at it than other people. Whereas Dr. Fate is like an eternal powerful being Mm -hmm. that has a particular agent so yeah so he is crazy crazy powerful yeah so i'm not saying that he wouldn't do it selfish like as a selfish reason he just lied to grundy i think it would be a more of like if i do this that is opening up a door in the cosmic realm that i will never be able to shut again okay that's fair yeah a soul to you are technically dead yeah and i cannot in as a as a being of order and and you know i cannot return a soul to a dead body yeah that's probably true yeah he's just kind of doing what's necessary yes Um, i said to you what i said because it is what i knew would yeah make you you know bring order that's fair uh and it's kent nelson kent nelson kent nelson yeah i had had the kent part yeah i think that was close um but yeah so now we can actually get on to part two (laughs) now we established that very critical piece of information um but yeah so then we also we get a little bit more backstory on two different fronts. So we get the the origins of Atlantis, mm-hmm. which in this case is that the actual like so Poseidon who ruled Atlantis at the time to basically send back the the ain't the old ones. Yeah, the very old- well named. The yes. old ones. <laughs> is it with the Lovecraft version? Is the ancient ones? Yes. Or, okay, so it's not far off, really, is it? And and that's yeah. I I think I brought this up before we started recording. I know. I don't know a lot about Lovecraft. Yeah. And, you know, Lovecraft Country is not a good base of Lovecraftian storytelling. Right. Um, But I know just enough where I know that all of this is 
a ripoff. Yeah. I mean, it's blatantly a ripoff. Yeah. When they said Ichthulu, you're like, oh, you're not even trying. Yeah. You're really not even Dwayne. trying. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> but this history of Atlantis is that Poseidon basically to def- fend off Ichthulu forges the trident from all of like the, the ambient cosmic energy in on earth and uses it to drive them back. But in doing so, he compromises the magic that was keeping Atlantis above the ocean and it sinks back down to the floor. Yeah. So a- as the big Atlantis head, Atlantean head, Atlantean Stan here of the two yeah. of us, how did you feel about that version of the Atlantean origin? I, okay. So the, <laughs> the cynic in me <laughs> is thinking like, Hey, ancient Greek man, uh how about you don't pick a or how about you don't pick a plot of land that's only held up by magic and how about you just go you know athens didn't sink you no. know why because it has a fucking foundation under it <laughs> <laughs> i mean there's that yeah um no i was fine with it, it okay it's, it's always some version of that where there's a great magical force that causes Atlantis to split off from the rest of the mainland, yeah. which then will lead it to collapsing into the ocean. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously I, Atlantis the lost empire is, is my main source. Of course. Cause it's so good. Uh, it is good. And it, it's basically the exact same thing, but um, it was not the trident, but it, it was, again, they created a giant defense. Yeah. Which caused the city to break off from, the rest of Greece. Bloop, 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 bloop. Mm-hmm. Then it goes. Yep. Yeah. All their cool technology. Yep. All that sweet blue glowy technology. Yeah. I've seen the movie once. I can't remember it. It's good. It's good. It's very good. Yeah, it's good. There's like the more I learn about Atlantis and the more like, cause it's, it, the story goes all the way back to like, uh, Socrates. Okay. Like he tells parables of this city of Atlantis. Yeah. And like this, it's been around forever. Mm-hmm. And I think that is so cool that like, you know, the story goes back to ancient Greece. Yeah. And it's still like has a, a, a somewhat relevance to pop culture. It's like so deeply ingrained in the zeitgeist that you can just call something Atlantis. People know all that you need to know right yeah, there. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. And even Futurama's amazing parody of it. Oh, Atlanta. Yeah. Atlanta. <laughs> when Atlanta sank. <laughs> God, that show is so good. It is. But yeah, so we get that backstory in Atlantis. And then we also get some backstory on the Thanagarians who used to worship Cthulhu as a god. And then he granted them basically science and mathematics and philosophy and technology, including the technology that's in Hawk Girl's Mace, which we'll eventually come to know as Nth Metal. Um, but the price that she puts it was too high because he basically just would take away the souls of the ancient Thanagarians. And at a certain point, they're like, nah, fuck this we're done with you. And they just banished him and refused to worship any higher power following that, Mm -hmm. which is also like kind of an interesting way of um, like setting up a semi scientific, semi magical alien race. Yeah. And also goes great into paralleling her frustration with wonder woman. Yeah. Because when she hears wonder woman make these oaths, she's calling forth from a greater power, which is so against the Antigarian code. Yeah. And I I think that's one of the things I liked about this episode is that it's about hot girls lack of faith. Mm-hmm. And as someone I'm, I'm basically more or less an atheist. Like I just, I don't really have a sense of faith. Like there are times when I have a hard time understanding people who do have faith, like, and I can respect it, but I don't, I don't get it. And there is almost like a, a bit of a jealousy that comes to that sometimes. Like it would be nice to be able to, have faith in someone or something beyond just, you know, the taking things at face value. Yeah. And well, it's hard to do. And I, I can appreciate that storytelling here. I, I agree. Absolutely. And, and I think the, the big difference is understanding our version of faith versus <laughs> the comic version of faith. Not, not even, not, you know, not, not on the, on the surface level, but like, I think Young Justice does a great version of this mm-hmm. where Wally refuses to believe magic exists. Oh, that everything yeah. Everything has a scientific explanation. Yeah. Where in this universe, we do see this idea of God or this idea of a deity always kind of reverts back to just another creature trying to harness power. I mean, Dark yeah. Side is a God to his people. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cthulhu is a god who who can grant this power but in 
you know, he is still a person. Yeah, he's a being. He's a sentient, living, breathing, killable being. Yeah. Uh, but it does kind of make Faith such a more interesting question there. Because, like, in a sense, you do know there is something bigger, yeah. sometimes better, sometimes badder out there. And so to say you don't believe in anything, because what's the, uh, oh, what what is it from where Superman makes the, no, Captain America makes the line. Oh, there's only one God, ma'am, and I'm pretty sure doesn't dress like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a like, great line. <laughs> yeah. And I, I love that idea in, in, in Marvel yeah. and in, in DC, because I feel like, you know, Superman could say something like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when you have literally fought gods. Yeah. There's a whole place called New Genesis, New Genesis. which is just new gods. It's the new gods, yeah. And, well, and, and even to your point with, with Hawker and the rest of the Thanagarians, they know that these sort of beings exist. It's yeah. not like it's a hypothetical thing of like, oh. It's not like someone was scamming them. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, was this all just like made up to try and explain like things that could not be explained without developed science like way back thousands of years ago and now people still hold on to it? Yeah. Sort of thing. Like, no, these existed. And so it's her her lack of faith is interesting because there is something to believe in, but she refuses to because she and the rest of her people have been scorned yeah. by it. And so that judgment that she then casts even unintentionally on other people who have it, she kind of judges Wonder Woman for having it. And she doesn't fully understand Grundy's faith that, you know, he will be reunited with his soul after he dies again. Mm -hmm. And I, I think knowing that it was building up towards that, that moment. I mean, obviously the rest of the episode is them just basically like trying to stop the rest of the demons or the, the beings from going through the portal into Atlantis and then a uh, splinter group going off and trying to defeat Ichthulu. And ultimately it's Grundy who like cracks through the skull of Ichthulu and basically just goes around and scrambles the inside of his brains. Yeah. Um, and ultimately it kills him again. It's a really heartbreaking moment actually when he dies again and, and hot girl is trying to there and comfort him and has to support and encourage Grundy's faith, even though she doesn't have it herself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I found myself getting emotional when I watched that. Okay. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I look, I think it might be odd that I did more so than that you didn't. Well, so. I mean, you, I, I think because you know what's coming, and I yeah. have vague memories of the episode that, that's coming up where he returns. Mm -hmm. um, the, like, you you know you you feel that because you know the rest of the story yeah um where for me this is my second time seeing grundy <laughs> this year fair it's and not like, quite the same okay yeah all right there's another villain gone yeah batman could have saved him probably <laughs> he could have <laughs> there's and this is you know probably getting a little too metaphysical with all of this um but especially when it, it kind of comes back to these ideas of faith and very westernized mm -hmm. i feel like learning about various mythologies from around the world over the past nine months um it's interesting to see the idea of kind of a deity that is perfect is a mm. very westernized concept yeah and and infallible whereas when you have going back to like greek and norse and hindu and in chinese mythologies the gods make mistakes yeah and i think you know having the thanagarians be like oh this guy did one thing wrong and you know it's a big thing he stole souls like, yeah yeah pretty he's, big, yeah pretty big neg negative but it's also you know a big part of old religions was sacrifice yeah and so when you have one thing that made him infallible they're like oh we can't believe this anymore i feel like it's a very western concept of handling that deity and and i feel like that also kind of falls along the lines of um usually if there is a singular god that one is infallible whereas all the mythologies you reference i'm pretty sure have multiple gods or multiple deities which makes a big difference yeah yeah because that was what i, I recently started learning about J uh, japanese mythology mm -hmm. and that is what's interesting about them is they they are multi they're uh poly, 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 what's the word paul i mean not polyamorous no the other one <laughs> it's a very different thing yep <laughs> uh i i'm not certain what the second part of that is but yeah, yeah like polytheistic polytheism yes polytheist, yes polytheistic. okay cool uh, there we go also i want on the record to not look that up and edit that out that yeah. <laughs> off the dome <laughs> um you know they are they are polytheistic especially with their older deities and they're they're multi-tiers of commies 
K A M I. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I forgot I have to. <laughs> There's King Kong. If, if you've ever watched Dragon Ball, not you, the listeners. Right. Um, you know, King Kami, and then there's Supreme Kami and, and Supreme Kai, and there's this tier mm-hmm. of gods that continue to outpace each other. That is okay. very much connected to Japanese myth. Oh, okay. That's um, interesting. But yeah, even then, like, if a god makes a mistake, that god is like severely punished by the other supreme gods yeah and so even like the lower tier deities like the earth commies um they like the origin of earth is this weird stupid story i think it's kind of stupid where it's like two a male and female deity came to this water planet and the only way they could get married was they walked the entire length of the globe and then met on the other side for the wedding but then the it's also very bad thinking about it now the woman talked to the man first which made the whole ceremony null and void so oh they had to God. do it again of course under the punishment of the higher up commies yeah um i mean that's not too far different from just adam and eve yeah at the end of the day exactly it's, it's always woman's fault of um, fucking hell but yeah so even having these multi-tier there is always a a tier above them that is more kind of infallible oh okay to become increasingly infallible as you you go up right whereas yeah. greek it's zeus is the top he's the one that fucks the most <laughs> oh yeah zeus gets away with a lot yeah <laughs> a lot there was a great video that i saw earlier this week there was a, a guy or a, a guy coming home and it's a, a joke on the the mary and joseph story yeah it's like Joseph, I'm so sorry. I was in, I was collecting eggs and suddenly one of the chickens started to have sex with me <laughs> and, and now I'm pregnant. I don't know what to do. And the guy goes, Zeus. Zeus. <laughs> <laughs> it's always Zeus. It's always Zeus. <laughs> Fucking Zeus. Yeah, like it, I, I, I felt like this episode kind of tackled some of these ideas about different types of faith and different types of theology in a way that felt n- neither ham fisted nor overly simplified mm-hmm. to some degree. Like it's more, it's not necessarily about what people believe in, but whether they believe in it or not. Yeah. Um, and I think they did a nice job letting that dynamic unfold. And I think it was a smart choice in their part also to focus on hot girl one, because we just don't get a lot of hot girl stories in this up to this point. Um, but two, she's more complicated, I think, than the other ones. I also love that this gave an opportunity to form a friendship between Hot Girl and Grundy. Like and that, that, anyone, really. And anyone, <laughs> like yeah, Everyone I mean, kind yeah, of hates it, on Hot Girl at this point. You know, she has her her blooming romance with, uh, with GL. But other than that, like, she doesn't necessarily have friends and acquaintances, something like that. And so just that, that it is a sweet relationship of, like, you know, Grundy and Bird Nose. I love that he calls her Bird Nose. Mm-hmm. It's really, really cute. And of course, that's going to come back again in JLU. But I bought in because I bought into that friendship and because I was along for the emotional journey of the friendship, it allowed me to just be on board with the whole thing. And I was able to forgive it for its more absurd blatant plagiarism. Yeah. I, after just talking about it and like this is, you know, we, we had a very long talk about faith, which is not something that we normally I know. Do. <laughs> Surprising for uh, us. <laughs> it is. I guess like that is in one sense very important for kids to see yeah and kind of understanding that people have different faiths and beliefs and yeah some more magical than others. exactly and it's it's not a purely religious based faith mm-hmm. which is what makes it kind of nice it's, yeah. it's more just like faith in something more than yourself um which doesn't have to be a a god in the very traditional like westernized version as we are often told it is right so yeah, I mean, like at the end of the day, I went to like a Jesuit university, and I'm like, a, as did I, a fucking atheist. <laughs> I had to take religion classes, you know, and I, I found interesting things to like think about and mull over when I was there. Um, actually, the theology of marriage is one of my favorite classes. Oh, which is weird from someone who is both an atheist and not necessarily inclined to get married. Yeah. <laughs> so. And mine was interreligious studies. See, that would be interesting. It was very fun. Yeah, we just watched South Park a lot. That's fantastic, <laughs> as you should um but yeah i mean the so there's this beautiful moment where grundy sacrifices himself which it was ultimately the end game there right like he was gonna be sacrificed for the spell and this time he chooses to sacrifice himself yeah to defeat ichthulu and then you know hot girl is very upset about it and you know um 
basically tells him like, you know, to have faith that you'll be reunited with her soul. And then the nice thing is they had that really sweet burial sequence at the end where they're all standing there and, you know, hot girl has done it, done a burial based on earth customs. And so, you know, Grundy is buried with a grave. just says Solomon Grundy born on a Monday, mm-hmm. which do you know why it says born on a Monday? It's part of the children's rhyme. Exactly. Yeah. Born on Monday, christened on Tuesday, something on Wednesday. I don't remember the rhyme anymore. So do you want the full version? It just uh, has more words. It's not that much longer. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it was the... I, I just remember from Injustice, that was the combo, was you would get him to say his rhyme. Oh, okay. And he was my favorite character to play. Okay, I mean, Solomon... He was so fucking broken in that game. He's great. But yeah, so it's Solomon Grundy, born on a Monday, christened on a stark and stormy Tuesday, married on a gray and grisly Wednesday, took ill on a mild and mellow Thursday, grew worse on a bright and breezy Friday, died on a gray and glorious Saturday buried on a baking blistering sunday that was the end of solomon grundy doesn't rhyme as well i think if i had said monday tuesday wednesday yeah. grundy it may have worked better i over enunciated as i want to do yes. but I, I i really like that final little mm-hmm. little tag there which is really nice and then I, I have kind of one more big thing on this if we're talking about uh blatant ripoffs and plagiarism oh you know i love to this episode is actually di- kind of just copied and pasted from the Defenders comics, the Marvel's Defenders comics. Okay, yeah, I, I read a few things about that. Yes, exactly. So specifically, the the initial pairing of the four people trying to um, reseal this breach. So of uh, Aquaman, Dr. Fate, Inza, who's... Uh, Dr. Fate's wife. Wife, yes and partner and then solomon grundy those are essentially the equivalents for the defenders which are namor dr strange clea who has the same relationship to strange as Mm -hmm. inza has fate and then solomon grundy is essentially the hulk yeah and i guess even in the comics hulk refers to fate as stupid magician hawk girl as bird nose oh no yeah aquaman as fish man and that's what hulk calls those same characters Mm -hmm. in the comics as well so Dwayne it's like it is i I, i'm choosing to treat that more of like an homage yeah that's an ode yes an homage to those ancient like those old comics rather than is like a a blatant ripoff and i love stuff like that like i really loved in it's not quite the same but in x-men evolutions there's one episode that actually unites the five original Mm x-men on a mission it's like it's little things like that of like okay it's fun to have these um surprising pairings and knowing that it came from a place in the comics yeah even if it's the other comics in the case here but i i i really really love these episodes they're some of my favorites super excited to um see the follow-through on it once we eventually get to justice League unlimited but yeah i don't know i mean have i convinced you to like these episodes more after our um, long conversation also slightly spanning fate? i don't i don't think i i, I don't want to say that i just you know i i didn't hate these episodes okay but it, it just was there was a lot going on yeah, that's just kind of meh. Because even like we skidded through a lot of what happened in that second half of the episode. In the second episode, Aquaman goes back to Atlantis and uses his troops as fodder to yeah. get through the breach on his own. He calls some whales in to come yeah. smack around some demons. Superman things. and Wonder Woman are also fighting the breach from the other side. And then it's yeah. kind of this aqua- uh, aquatic uh, ex mahina oh yeah <laughs> where aquaman comes in in the middle of a monster and just bursts out i mean he is a badass yeah like oh you know that's 10 minutes of this episode is, is yeah. jumping between those two and, it, and that it, is you don't need any of that None no of that is, is important it, to this story it's it's decent action um and you know it does help pad the time a little bit it, it's a nice like counterpoint to what's going on with like the grundy hot girl stuff too yeah but yeah, overall, I don't, overall, I really, really like these. Mm-hmm. And uh, the nice thing is, is, I know I'll win when it comes to the shortlist conversation because we have to, we have it. to include it. Yeah, <laughs> I'll br- I'll pull up my argument when we get there. Oh really? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> do be determined down the line here. Um. All right. So why don't we uh, kind of wrap things up here? Let's do. Why don't we do plugs? Your question, and then we'll wrap things up with some notes from friends. Cool. Um, so what do you got to plug this week, Cameron? I had a very themed week this week. Mm-hmm. I watched a documentary on Amazon, which has been on my list for a while, okay. called The Orange Years. Okay. And it is the history of Nickelodeon. Oh, and okay. It is amazing. I Obviously, I Nickelodeon's always been very, very close to my heart since I was a, a wee lad. 
Um, and the Orange Years, it spans kind of 1975 when the original concept of kind of a children's network started mm-hmm. through 2000. Okay. Um, following kind of the, the main woman that ran that sect of Viacom, of, of Viacom mm-hmm. at the time, um, who was just an amazing woman. Yeah. Um, I, I just blanked on her name and I'm so sorry. You deserve so much better than this. Honestly, Cameron. Um, but she basically came and like created the discovery channel and a bunch of other channels outside mm-hmm. of that. Her and her husband are like very well known executive producers around Hollywood. Uh, but like the the first line of the documentary is this channel was made by women, mm-hmm. and they talk oh. about like at every stage there was always a very powerful woman in the in the studio making oh. Nickelodeon happen. I had no idea. Um, but yeah, it is fascinating going back to I'll do a, a very quick because I this part I found so fascinating because I didn't know anything about this mm-hmm. at the start. Have you ever heard of Cube? Q U B E. It's ringing some sort of vague bell in the back of my brain. It was an experiment done in the seventies for television for for television viewers and mm-hmm. I guess the audience. Um, that was kind of paired with a Nelson box. Okay, Nielsen. Nielsen box. Thank yeah, you. the Nielsen rating boxes. Um, yeah. Yeah, the the Kent Nielsen box. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh where you would get kind of this multi-button remote that would interact with the TV. Mm-hmm. And so they made custom programming back then. So like the, the biggest show was kind of an, an America's Got Talent, American Idol kind of spinoff, where you would have a live performance come on and you could vote if you wanted them to move forward or not live as they were performing. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, and that would determine how long they got to continue their set for. Yeah. If a lot of people said no, they'd cut them off at a minute 30. Very gong show-esque. Sure. Um, but it was this experiment done in like the middle of Missouri. Hmm. Uh, and it didn't last very long. It lasted like a year. And they canned it. But I I, I knew nothing about that. Yeah. And that is fascinating. That was in the 70s. That was 1975. Mm-hmm. They were already trying this, which like still hasn't been figured out to this day. But Lord, do they keep trying? Do they keep trying? Yeah. yeah. Quibi is because Quibi. of that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it is a, a very fun, very like warm documentary, mm-hmm. especially when they get to the animation era, which oh, is what yeah. I know best. Of course. And they're like, oh yeah, how did Doug become to be? It's like, oh, like the pitch was bad. <laughs> like it made no sense. Yeah. But the guy, because the guy who created Doug, um, dresses like doug every day that's just his normal outfit is the 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 green sweater vest with the white button down undershirt yeah the the khakis oh my god it's just who he is yeah and like yeah we just wanted him around he was just (laughs) so nice everyone's like yeah we'll just give him anything we just don't want him to leave yeah that's amazing yeah uh i i don't want to spoil too much of it but highly highly go recommend check out that the orange years uh yes the orange years and then from that there's another weird experiment that I watched, which I told you about earlier this week called Pluto TV. Mm, yeah. Also done by Viacom. And it's kind of this, exp- it's a free channel. I don't want to call it a streaming service, but it's mm-hmm. kind of like this in between space between cable and streaming. And it is a bunch of kind of individualized channels on this free platform. <clears throat> so a lot of classic stuff, which is what I've been kind of flipping through a lot. Mm-hmm. So there's an Adam's family channel, oh. which just plays randomized reruns of Adam's family. Mm-hmm. They have with like the Carol Burnett show. Um, who's the former host of the tonight show, Johnny Carson, Johnny Carson, mm-hmm. which is a whole channel for him. Uh, Dick Van Dyke and Mary Tyler, Mary Tyler Moore show. Mm-hmm. Bob Ross, and then going into the reason I jumped into it is they'll give a couple hour block of the old Nick game shows. Oh, okay. So going back and watching Double Dare and and Hidden Temple and mm-hmm. Guts, oh. and yeah, what a great time! What to, last thing I'll, I'll say about the documentary because I just loved this moment. They talk about they're interviewing the kids from all that because mm-hmm. they filmed that in orlando in universal studios that's right yeah actual studio yeah and they basically said like they'd break for lunch and it was a contest between the kids to see who could 
escape their handler and just hide in the park for the longest. <laughs> and so they had, most of them just like wouldn't eat lunch. The second they broke, they'd run and get on the rides. Yeah. And just like who could escape set the longest was the game they would play daily. And as a kid, that sounds amazing. As yeah. a now adult, I'm like, fuck, that would be so problematic I, on so many levels. I would feel bad for the PAs who are responsible to try and track these kids down. Exactly. <laughs> Cause these are like well-known kids. And so like, obviously the rest of the cat or the rest of the crew universal probably knew them. Yeah. And you've definitely had some that were on their side. Cause yeah. you know, no one, you know, fuck the man. <laughs> and like that, just that world sounds like a dream world. Yeah. Very different time. Yeah. Well, I'm not too surprised that your theme of your bat plugs this week was nostalgic nickelodeon but i love yes. it that those both sound amazing yes so. highly recommend both of them pluto tv is just this i feel like there's something for everyone on there okay and interesting yeah there are commercials which, yeah which is, is why it's free yeah it's why it's not a paid subscription so. yeah um and then I, I know you've mentioned before but we talked so much about mythology this week what's the you're listening to a book on tape or you listening to a podcast there's about a, mythology what's it called uh, i think it's worth throwing in here because we've talked about it so much this yeah, week yeah it's it's an audiobook well there there's two kind of parallel things that i've listened to together mm -hmm. um there's an audiobook just called mythology mega saga okay which is this it's basically a compilation of a bunch of different mythology books which is weird that it's just one credit on audible mm -hmm. sponsor of this week audible right <laughs> yes um because it's kind of eight different books and you can even tell because it's a different narrator for each section. oh interesting okay but it goes over greek mythology norse mythology japanese hindu um mesopotamian mm -hmm. egyptian chinese uh it, it's amazing okay it, they go over the main gods and then kind of give summaries of the big stories of mm -hmm. those mythologies yeah uh but then there's also a podcast called myth and, myths and legends myths and legends okay um which does a great breakdown i found it because they do great deep dive into Arthur or arthurian legends mm -hmm. which i'm also a big sucker for yes as we have established yes <laughs> that he he dabbles a little bit in um polynesian mythologies which mm -hmm. i'm also a big sucker for yes uh it's great it, okay. it's a very very well-made podcast nice okay yeah worth throwing those in the uh, the show notes down there if you guys want to do a little more of a deep dive on mythology since this yeah. was a very mythology heavy episode what about um, you? What have you been listening, watching, reading? Uh, I watched a movie this last week called Mommy Dearest, which is kind of one of those movies that is so culturally like imbued that once you see it, you recognize the references. But so the, the movie stars um, Faye Dunaway playing the classic film actress Jane Fonda, not Jane Fonda, <laughs> Joan Crawford. So it's Faye Dunaway playing Joan Crawford. Joan Crawford was a you know very famous actress in like the, the 30s and on. She mm -hmm. had a very famous feud with Betty Davis, which was covered in the film Feud. Um, and then their like on, like off screen difficulties then like seeped into their on screen personas in another film called uh, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. If you want to go see like an actual Joan Crawford movie, but so this is essentially a biopic, and what it it's a weird movie and it was kind of pitched to me as like super high camp, mm -hmm. which it basically is. So we're always talking about good, bad movies and bad, good movies, you know, like a, a good, bad movie being one that is um, like just really terribly made, but it's fun to watch because 90 percent of John Claude Van Damme's exactly John Claude Van Damme. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think our classic example is Batman forever and especially Batman and Robin, a good, yes. bad movie, like a fun watch, even though it's, not necessarily well made whereas a bad good movie is one that was intended to be you know like this epic masterpiece and just completely falls apart um i'm looking at you dark knight rises is my classic example of that say anything james cameron that's not titanic uh well hang on true lies whoa wait hey, whoa whoa sorry cameron, I, cameron. Yeah, I'll, I'll go back it's just avatar back the flying <laughs> fuck up here terminator yeah terminator 2 yep true lies never seen it titanic true uh, true lies my personal favorite is because it's kind of a james bond spoof okay sort of but it's also very sincere i don't know i'm sorry weird. it's just avatar for everyone that's not me exactly yeah but i mean you you there are lots of examples in recent history of you know what i often refer to as oscar bation sort of films mm -hmm. um a lovely portmanteau of oscar bait and masturbation for obvious reasons yeah. this is somehow both a good bad movie and a bad good movie like oh, it was intended to be 
like an Oscar contender. It was made with absolute seriousness, but it is also horribly directed and like terribly edited. And the thing is, is it starts out at 11 and never lets up. Good. Like it, it, it is. Hell yeah. It is just constantly like this, this absolute extremes because the story is basically it, it's adapted from an autobiography of um, Christine Crawford, who was the adopted daughter of Joan Crawford. It basically just details what a psycho Joan Crawford was mm-hmm. and all the abuse that Christine and her brother Christopher suffered at the hands of this woman who like was just this vainglorious, insane monster. Um, and so there's these like extremes these moments that are absolutely insane. Like I think the most famous one, and I guess if you're a big RuPaul fan, they make constant reference to this movie. And I'm that one gay that doesn't watch RuPaul, but there's this whole scene where Joan Crawford shows up in the middle of the night in like full on face mask. Like her face is bleached, almost Joker white. And she comes across a wire hanger and like like her daughter's dress on a wire hanger in the closet. And she has this total meltdown about no wire hangers. Like that's like it's peak insanity, but it never wavers too far from that. Um, so it's it's a very bizarre piece and it has this sort of like pop culture resonance because it's just so over the top. Mm-hmm. Like I, I did enjoy it a lot. It it doesn't uh, I will say this ahead of time. It's not really quite a spoiler, but it doesn't necessarily have a super satisfying ending to it because it's a true story. Like you, you don't get that like real punch of um, like comeuppance that you kind of want given how terrible Joan Crawford is the way she's portrayed. Yeah, but it's. It's totally weird, and if you, like, have heard of it, I, I, it's worth watching. It's worth watching. It's it's intense. It's also, and it's hard to do right now, obviously, because we're in a, a pseudo sort of quarantine lockdown situation, but it's also best enjoyed with a group who you can all kind of laugh at with the film. Yeah. Like, it is funny if you're the group of people that can just go, like, oh, my God, this is so insane and ridiculous. Like, this, we're all going to laugh at it. So it's it's one of those weird movies you can kind of watch it as, like, a disaster and failed filmmaking at the same time as it is just like stupid and fun. Mm -hmm. Very bizarre movie. Um, But yeah, check that one out. Interesting. It's a weird, it's a weird one. Yeah. Um, So that's my major plug this week. And then, uh, you know, as I mentioned last week, we've now joined uh, the pod tower on YouTube with the DCAU watchtower. And actually, I always call them that. That's just their Twitter handle. They're the Watchtower Database. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For the Watchtower Database and the DCAU Review. Um, and so just want to give a shout out to the DCAU Review, whose latest episode that came out on Saturday, the day we're recording this, uh, is all about the Batman Beyond episode, The Final Cut, which is one of the Curare episodes. Ooh. So, yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. So go uh, check out their stuff, too. So I think that does it for plugs. Uh, and then why don't we get to your question, Cameron? Yeah, it's uh, I guess it's more of a prompt than a question. Mm-hmm. Is um, it a writing prompt? Do do I have a uh, yes. you know a, a blue book that I have to write out a, a pencil drawn answer for four or five pages in yeah, two well, hours? I just need sketches. Oh shit! All right, I'm out. Yeah, <laughs> I can't draw. Uh, so as people who've been listening to this know, I am an avid Disneyland theme park uh obsessor yes and so i was trying to imagine because you know we have marvel land coming out eventually mm-hmm. whenever disneyland reopens um but dc properties are usually teamed up with six flags yeah and they do decent theming decent you know good rides but mm-hmm. the theming is never really there to match the disney quality yeah so my prompt slash question was what would a dc theme park and you know there's a difference between theme park and amusement parks yes. what a dc theme park look like uh and i asked you help pitch a land and mm-hmm. a ride yes what would one section of this theme park look like mm-hmm. yeah so uh i thought about this a little bit and obviously i immediately gravitated towards gotham because yeah. it's the most popular ones most yeah, likely it makes thing. the most sense yeah, it makes the most sense you could do a lot with that batman has the best rose gallery so i was trying to think of ride that would center around batman's rogues gallery and mm-hmm. th- there are many more to come up with but the two the sprang to mind immediately that i latched on to uh one would be a duck paddle boat ride inside the iceberg mm-hmm. lounge yep so <laughs> which i think would just have like it'd be cool to see like the theming of it you can't imagine it would look similar to the way it does in the new batman adventures of like this big old-fashioned lounge around the outside and in the middle is like a big little gloom with maybe a big iceberg in the middle and everyone's out on little ducky paddle boats 
Um, okay. Fuck, you could do it Pirates of the Caribbean style. That's exactly what I was I also thinking. Also have a restaurant, like that an actual the, restaurant. That's the exact thought I had. Yeah. It's definitely just remake Blue Bayou. Yeah, exactly. But it's Iceberg Lounge. I think it'd be really fun. Everyone's dressed up in tuxedos, and you know, you can make a whole thing out of it. So that was one. And the other one I had was a uh, Killer Croc Chase to the Sewers ride. You just really want sewers to be a big component. Of this I do. I <laughs> really do. But. So I, I forget, Cameron, have you played the Arkham games? I have. So you, you played Arkham Asylum then, the first one. Yes. So you remember the big croc sequence mm-hmm. is you're trying to like track down the bits of the plant spores in the sewers. And you have to like very carefully walk across the wooden planks and not disrupt croc or else they come and chase you. Mm-hmm. So the idea was basically make that into a kind of roller coaster style ride. So you're like strapped into like a proper roller coaster type car, but you start out like you know and say space mountain for example there's like that part where you're kind of slowly ramping up to get to the top before you go and it goes all crazy you're doing that but you're moving slowly and the, the story reason behind it is that you're creeping through the sewers trying to avoid or escape from croc yeah right and so and then there's moments where like you know you go over a spot and you can see the water bubbling or you see like a shadow going through like on a side tunnel like you're kind of trying to navigate around him and then at a certain point he spots you and then the ride actually kicks into full speed. So now you're on a roller coaster kind of going through sewer tunnels trying to escape him. And you can build in lulls in the speed of like you think you've escaped him and you slow down again for a little bit and then he reappears and you speed up again. So it's like a way to take the, the roller coaster mechanics which occasionally require you to slow down but build it around a narrative of you trying to escape from Croc. And then interweave it with high speed sections. Yeah, that's great. I love that. I know I really want to go on this ride after I came up with it. I'm like, damn, this sounds amazing. I, I feel that pain a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, those are the two that I came up with. What did no, you have? I love that. Yeah. I was trying to break out of the the general mole because like obviously Gotham is the go-to. Metropolis would be the go-to. Right. And so I was trying to think of like what would be a... Atlantis? Is yours in Atlantis? Atlantis. <laughs> No, I was trying to think of like what would be a comparison to Tomorrowland that's not Metropolis. Okay. And I would love a new Genesis. Oh, land. okay. Yeah. I don't know what you could do there exactly because mm-hmm. the only ride I thought of was for Gotham. Of course. <laughs> um, but I think having a new Genesis themed area, because especially after seeing like Pandora mm-hmm. done so well, you can do these huge scale futuristic sci-fi cities yeah. done to impeccable detail mm-hmm. um and then also doing a lot of looking into super mario world that just opened in japan which just looks gorgeous yeah um you know i think there's something very unique they can do there i don't i like i said i don't know enough to think of a ride at the moment but it was something like the, like the jetpacks that everyone has mm-hmm. um riding on <laughs> there's, there's the ride in pandora where you're riding on the back of uh of an ikran or a banshee uh yes i did have to do that um uh, which is like one of the best rides i've ever been on yeah um but i'm just imagining that but instead of riding the banshee you're riding uh on the back of orion <laughs> just <laughs> guiding you around the city which i'm sure he would love yeah um but again i don't know what the ride for this would be but i was thinking uh you can either make it part of the ride and make it kind of like the hogwarts ride mm-hmm. at either of the universal parks or just have this be the queue but i want to physically walk around the bat cave oh that would be some cool capacity yeah so obviously one of the rides is going to be in the batmobile yeah uh that you know kind of your test track kind of your mm-hmm. car's ride where yeah it's slow then fast and slow then fast um but yeah I like your ideas a lot better, having them based around the villains. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I should have put a lot more thought into this, and I will definitely put more thought into this after we record. Um, but yeah. No, I like that. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, you could do a, a test track style Batmobile, like a Batmobile pursuit thing across the city. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the, the, the line to get into it, you go through the Batcave, which would be pretty cool. Yeah. And then also thinking about like uh, Disneyland Paris, where they just have so many walkthrough things, which mm-hmm. I think is so fascinating. And is such a foreign idea to Americans just walk places. Yeah. Um, How dare we? I know. But one of the things I love is underneath their castle, there is the dragon's lair. And mm. you can actually walk through and see a sleeping dragon. So you're supposed to be quiet to not wake it. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Just loving that idea of like you can like Wayne Manor is one of the buildings you can walk through. And if you yeah. find the secret, there's like a almost like uh, 
the pirate's lair on Tom Sawyer's Island. There mm. be like these secret passages that lead you to different parts of the bat cave downstairs. That would be cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can go into the bat wing hangar, the bat boat dock. Yeah. That'd be so much the fun. Armory. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wherever Nightwing works out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can you <do> sock foo? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> sock foo in the laundry room of Wayne Manor. Yep. Yeah. I'm here for it. Yeah. If you haven't looked at uh, Super Nintendo Land, it is the most, like, you look at concept art and you look at real photos like this can't be Mm -hmm. real there's no way this exists in reality yeah it's so beautiful no it's gonna be exciting once it opens up yeah you're gonna have to go back to japan yeah i'm ready i don't think there was that was much of a push (laughs) to get you to do that though was it um Uh, but i i would love to hear people's suggestions on this yeah this is a really interesting topic um yeah so if you have suggestions for things you want to see in a uh a disney level themed Mm -hmm. dc park whether it's like a walkthrough exhibit or just the 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 theming of it the yeah for, design to, to or the give rides. like a, a basic template for what disney rides are there's the high speed rides which is kind of what we pitched mm-hmm. there's the dark rides which are the more storytelling pirates caribbean haunted mansion yeah um there's the interactive things and the the vr rides kind of like your um toy story or um no star tours oh star tours yeah yeah um and then the 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 ride in, in pandora yeah um yeah, those are kind of the main three. Mm-hmm. Thinking about restaurant theming. Oh, Lounge, yeah. I one. Is, yeah. Yep. Uh, something with Poison Ivy. I think it'd be very fun there. Yeah, her botanical gardens. Mm-hmm. Something in there, yeah. No, I mean, it, it's it's a it's an untapped concept, really. Yeah. And, uh, be, I would love to hear people's thoughts. Um, yeah, so I think for that, the best place is to send it to, uh, let's be, probably Instagram. Uh, yes. Tim Talk Pod. Instagram's probably the best because that way camera might see it too. <laughs> um, but also Twitter is a great place too because I keep it on the Twitter. Yeah. And along if those you don't lines, want to see it. <laughs> yeah, if you don't want camera to see it, send it on Twitter. I'll look at it. Um, along those lines, uh, we have a few notes. We'll get through real quick Ooh. as we wrap things up here. Um, so uh, Jake, aka the Overvoid on Twitter, who's always lovely and sends in messages, uh, wrote in to talk about uh, Earth Fifty because we were talking about that with the Justice Lords. Okay. And he pointed out, he basically said, "Look up um, Earth Fifty One when a Batman. It's really messed up." And I forgot that I'd actually read the comics that dive into all this stuff. So Earth 50 was in, concluded in the ongoing Batman Beyond series. And I've read all of it like okay. up to a certain point. Um, and so this specific volume, for those who want to go check it out, is Batman Beyond 2.0 Volume 2 Justice Lords Beyond. But it basically, there's a point where the comic Beyond Terry, which is not quite the same as the DCAU, but it's kind of half dcau half comic books to some degree yeah but he ends up in the justice lords timeline and uh i won't go into exact specifics of what happens i think that they're worth reading they're pretty good but um the story of what happens to wonder woman in the the dcau beyond the show and then also her justice lords counterpart is really really like dark and twisted and okay. messed up um and even more twisted than what we saw in the show which makes sense it's a comic book versus the uh, the cartoon um but yeah go check that out so thanks jake for writing in and reminding me that was a thing because it's it's really really fucking weird um and then i also want to give a, a shout out to justin eddins on twitter who's at superkid uh 801 who just like every week you know always like likes and retweets pretty much everything we post and is always lovely and just chiming on comments on twitter and instagram and you know i just want to give him a g- general shout out for always just being uh, such an awesome guy and so yeah, supportive thanks, and he's he's super supportive of all the other stuff too, the Watchtower Database Boys, DCA Review, Susan Eisenberg, a lot of the cast when they post stuff, he, he's always jumping in and being a, just a, a totally awesome guy. So thank yeah, you. We really appreciate that. Yeah. And then the last thing here, I actually have uh, a question for you, Cameron. <gasps> yes, uh, a double question corner this week. Um, so we got a message from our friend on YouTube, Solomon Sultani, who has written in a few times and written us questions before. Um, and so he said, uh, he started off by saying, you know, Cameron doubting his Green Lantern knowledge, like GL doubting his powers in this episode it was great. <laughs> he was laughing at that. Um, but he said, seriously, though, I have a question for Cameron. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about Green Lantern Corps compared to the rest of the DC universe. Is there any book or comic book or guide that one should read to better familiarize themselves with the Green Lantern lore? So is there a, a comic you would recommend or a starting point you'd recommend? Oh, man, that's tough 
because I started in the middle, mm-hmm. but I think that is the best. When Jeff John first comes in okay. with Rebirth and okay. then kind of hits his peak at Blackest Night. Mm-hmm. I started at Blackest Night. So worth noting, this is Green Lantern Rebirth from like the yes, early sorry, 2000, 2000s? Yeah, 2001, 2003. Right, not the universe-spanning Rebirth titles that came out four or five years ago. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes. That is a very good it gets messy. difference we need to make. <laughs> yes. Yes. GL Rebirth. Okay. Is kind of when they reset Hal Jordan's character. Okay. Uh, that was, yeah, like we said, 2001 or 2003. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to learn about just him, that's probably the best place to jump in. And he has great story arcs. Mm-hmm. Um, there's Tales of the Core, which started shortly after, which follows my Guy Gardner stuff mm-hmm. and all of the other lanterns, which is very fun. Yeah. It's very broken storytelling. Okay. So you'll follow like one character for a couple pages and you won't see them again for like five issues. Oh, interesting. So that's okay. better for just like if you're binging comics yeah. so you can keep them all in order. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, honestly, like Blackest Night is, okay. is where I jumped in in the middle and you get an idea of all the lantern. Because I love it because there's so many cores at that right. point. You learn about the whole spectrum um and it especially if you enjoy jlu mm-hmm. when it gets to the point where like all of earth's heroes get rings and you have like mira as a red lantern mm-hmm. and flash as a blue lantern and scarecrow and lex and like heroes and villains yeah get to be part of this universe. like that is like peak green lantern for me so it would because i know that's there's some pretty dense complicated stuff in there and i'm pretty sure you've made reference to like having to do like constant research while reading that when you read it when you were younger. So yeah. So final crisis, which I think is the densest of the multiverse stories. Cause we talked about this earlier this year. Cause I read all that stuff. Yeah. And I was like, it was dense beyond my comprehension. I consider myself pretty knowledgeable about DC comics. Final crisis kills so many people. And blackest night is the story that comes out of that. Okay. Where, the black lantern ha- is is powered from death mm-hmm. and there was basically so much death that happened in final crisis that he became overwhelmingly powerful in an instant mm-hmm. and used that to take over the universe and everyone that died basically becomes a zombie lantern great yes is there anything you would recommend reading prior to blackest <laughs> night like it would rebirth help getting into blackest night or are you just gonna have to go into blackest night knowing that you're gonna have to do some background research i i mean that that's just kind of how i did it okay um and it's not ideal i mean now you have a lot more opportunity for backlogs when mm-hmm. i read it i was i was reading the paperbacks yeah um uh, and so it was all just being on wikipedia with every page yeah i mean i did that earlier this year when i got through the whole grant morrison run on on batman um lots of time spent hours spent just trying to figure out the right reading order mm-hmm. um uh, but also like the two animated films are great emerald knights and first flight yeah I just, funny enough, I just started rewatching the animated series. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, after watching Clone Wars now, mm-hmm. I realize it's just a ripoff of Clone Wars. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it is. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's them going, I guess it's closer to Rebels. Okay. Because it's them trying to find, like, Green Lanterns out in this void space to help them fight the Red Lanterns. Oh, okay, all um, right. Yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's, I- it's okay, I mean, my favorite character is Saint Walker in all of the Green Lantern universe outside of Kyle Rayner. Mm-hmm. Um, and he pops up a couple times in that series. Okay. I, I feel like those are good places, yeah, to get. Um, because that's the thing. These shows are often a good starting point to get the the basics in place. Mm-hmm. I'd say in terms of comics, um, I think I read Green Lantern Secret Origins with Jeff Johns, which is basically a retelling of Hal Jordan's origin a few years ago. I think it's both self-contained. I know they did an Earth-1 Green Lantern, which I haven't read, but a lot of the Earth-1 stuff is pretty good. I really Oh, love... Sinestro War. That, that's a big one. Okay, that's a big that's one, That's kind too. of the first splinter into yeah. the other colors. But I also feel like that's another one, too, that's like... It helps if you have some background knowledge, maybe a little bit going in. I've, I mean, it, it's just kind of Sinestro okay. knowledge, which you get from First Flight. Okay. Because I was going to say, other places look for like more simplified Green Lantern stories. I think I haven't read the Earth one. That might be worth checking out. Um, and then I'm going to plug it again, but DC New Frontier. I mean, Hal Jordan's a primary he does character have a in great that. arc in New Frontier. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's much more about Hal and his personality and his story than it is specifically Green Lantern. Mm-hmm. Um, but and again, if you're looking for an origin story for Hal, I think that's a great one to go to because you get so much more. And it's going to introduce you to other 
characters in that universe are going to pop up in things like probably Sinestro War and mm -hmm. uh, Blackest Night too. Yeah. So. Or if you just want a completely side story post Blackest Night and Brightest Day, there's an arc called New Guardians, which follows okay. just Kyle. Okay. Um, where the premise is out of the blue one day, he suddenly gets a ring from every core and it causes this huge fight between all the, all the kind of head of the lanterns Okay. of like, why is this guy being chosen? And you get to see him wield every color. Yeah. And it's like, Oh fuck. Kyle so, is the coolest. I, I do love that all of your suggestions are some of the most like dense, complicated green lantern <laughs> stories. So I, I'd say maybe to answer the specific question, well, it depends on like what aspect of green lantern you want to follow. Cause a lot of them do follow how, but I, I love the stories that go beyond just right. him. And I think the question may have been like maybe a good starting point. So oh, I think maybe the, your yeah. original answer of like Rebirth. <laughs> yeah, Rebirth might, is the best place Rebirth to might yeah. be a good place to start. And if you're liking that, then yeah, I think Blackest Night, Sinestro War, whatever you just said. Yeah, because Rebirth leads into Sinestro Core, which leads into Rage of the Red Lanterns. And then that basically leads into blackest night okay yeah for, so for just the green lantern straight arc yeah so the the TL... Agent orange is in there a little bit but that's not super important okay that's so the, just largely he's the tldr answer is rebirth yes yes <laughs> jeff john's rebirth from the early 2000s not the dc universe rebirth mm -hmm. yes so there you go there it is there we go <laughs> But wow, no, I, I read more than I thought I've there read. You go. That, that was See, yeah. Wow. And yet you still struggle so much talking Green Lantern in this There's podcast. There's so much. <laughs> There's so much. <laughs> but no, uh, thanks, Solomon, for writing in with the comment and for the question. Yes. Uh, yeah. And so you can find us if you have uh, thoughts on these episodes, questions for us to answer, if you have suggestions for Cameron's thoughts about the uh, DC based theme park. Mm -hmm. You can find us at Tim Talk Pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Gmail, and YouTube. Uh, we are also now up on the Pond Tower as well on YouTube. Uh, so go subscribe to that and find some other great DCAU content from our friends. Yeah. So, uh, and you can find me at Lordifer on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah. If you want to see my art, you can find that at Cameron.Dexter. If you want to see my face, you can find that at Cam Dexter underscore adventures boom 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 yes all right well i think that does it for us this week we'll be back next week to talk about uh secret society which is going to see the return of gorilla grod <gasps> Ooh. so of our remaining gorilla city gorilla city yes of our remaining episodes that's the only one i don't remember off the top of my head so that'll be a fun thing to uh explore good as we uh we enter the home stretch here heading towards uh star so <laughs> which one it's a small episode okay that has it's, a, it's just the single episode right? yeah it's just a one part thing has absolutely no repercussions for any of the rest of the dc universe going forward cool i kind of need just like a break from yeah <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a small little thing yeah very digestible uh but uh, thanks for listening as always everyone and we'll see you then yeah thanks guys bye 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 bye